Welcome back to AP Gov. Uh, this is Chapter 9, Part 2, Lesson 2. And we're finishing up our discussion on campaigns and voting behavior. So I want to evaluate the fairness of the Electoral College system for choosing the president. Right, so I'm recording this video in January of 2021. We have just witnessed the 2020 election where Biden defeated Trump and President Biden has been inaugurated for about a week. And every time there's an election, there's always this discussion of what is the Electoral College? Is it the system that America should continue to use? And, and truthfully, the arguments for and against the Electoral College system shift depending on who wins and who loses. But in, in this lesson, I want to talk about the basics. So you need 270 electoral votes to win in the Electoral College out of a possible 538. So we, we know some of those basics and that, you know, want to get started with that. Uh, you know, states like Pennsylvania have 20 electoral votes. California has the most. Small states like Wyoming have, only have three. But let's talk a little bit more about where the Electoral College system came from um, and some of the myths that are surrounding us every time there's an election that we hear being repeated in the media that just aren't quite true. So, you know, some people say, well, the Electoral College was designed late in the Constitutional Convention, and it was kind of an afterthought. That's not true. It was actually within the first two weeks of the Constitution. James Wilson of Pennsylvania actually proposed that there would be some type of election for president by special electors. Another myth is that the Electoral College system prohibits the election of a president and vice president from the same state. Well, not really. Uh, but that is something that is continually uh, talked about a lot. It's the fact that the, it prohibits electors from casting both of his votes from individuals from the same state. It does not, however, prevent the election of a president and vice president from the same state. So um, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of, of that today. The third myth is um, talking about the fact that four times the Electoral College has elected a president that got fewer popular votes than his rival. So thus, somehow, the Electoral College system is bad. Well, let's remember that the national popular vote that we tabulate, it has nothing to do with actually who wins or loses. The national popular vote is something we add up because we're interested in knowing how many people in general voted for president. Um, but it has happened that the Electoral College elects a president that doesn't win the national popular vote. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, does, that, does that mean the Electoral College system is bad? No, and, that, and that's the argument. This is why this is a myth. Yes, someone can lose the popular vote and win the presidency through the Electoral College, but it's a myth that that's a bad thing. Remember that they're not campaigning for a national popular vote, right? Yeah. So in the 2020 election, if um, Trump would spend more time in California, would he be able to maybe lessen the the narrow of margin of victory of Biden over Trump? Or if Biden spent more time in Texas, could he have narrowed that margin even more? Maybe. And so thus, you might have seen a change in the popular vote, but they don't, people campaigning for president don't campaign for total popular vote of the country. They're campaigning for the popular vote of each state in the winner-take-all system. The fourth myth. The Electoral College system stipulates that the plurality winner of a state's popular votes gets all of the state's electoral votes. So, um, yes and no. You can win by plurality, but remember, states control these elections. So the states have that power, right? So Nebraska and Maine have split votes. So it's not necessarily a winner-take-all system. So it is a winner-take-all system in most areas, but states can control and change that. They, they could... Um, definitely shake up the system if there was not a winner take all. Like if you, you know, in Pennsylvania, there's 18 districts. If Pennsylvania changed a lot, you have to win 10 of the 18, then you win the state. That would definitely make uh, Pennsylvania more of a Republican leaning state. But it's not that way. It's winner take all. Uh, the fifth myth the framers designed the Electoral College because they didn't think the public was intelligent enough to elect um, a good president. Generally, maybe, maybe, uh, but 
probably that they are most um, interested in the fact that the states had such significant population differences. And the Electoral College would give each state a say, and so that presidents would not just be winning the vote of New York and Virginia, but having to um, really appeal to all of the original states in order to win an election. The last myth is electors can vote any way they want. Technically, they can. Um, but very few, less than a half a percent, ever have defected uh, and voted on their own free will. And this is usually because parties put forth electors who are pretty loyal to the party. And then the Supreme Court in 1952 did restrict the direction um, and the independence of electors. And so you don't really see that. Um, so something I think is really great, uh, it's not a foundational document, but it is an interesting document, is Federalist Number 68 by Alexander Hamilton. And in Federalist 68, he has the justification for the electoral college system. And if you're in my class, I printed the slide for you because it's super lengthy. Um, but take some time to read through this. Maybe, you know, Google the, the 68th uh, Federalist paper and read through it a little bit. But I'm going to summarize some of the big ideas that Hamilton summarizes, right? So first of all, he says the method of selecting the president has not really been criticized a lot by the anti-federalists. And that's because it's a really well-crafted system. He says, I venture somewhat further and hesitate not to affirm that if the manner of it not be perfect, it is at least excellent. And in the design of the system, the delegates were guided by a desire that people would have a say in deciding who would hold this very important office. But it wasn't necessarily a popular vote. Okay, It was going to be pre-established by by bodies of men who would cast their vote, people who probably had already been elected to some other form of government. The framers also wanted to ensure that those making the decision would be best capable of analyzing the qualities needed in a president. The system as designed by the framers also provides an efficient check on mob violence and disorders by requiring that the electors meet in their respective state capitals to officially cast those ballots. And it was desirable that every obstacle should guard against corruption. And this is another layer of protection. And a desire that the president be independent of all but the people. And again, the system creates a number of electors equal to its representation in Congress. And it's a nice system where every state gets at least two votes, or two votes from the Senate and at least one from the House, a minimum of three votes. Every state has a say. And in very close elections, um, like the election of 2000, where George W. Bush got 271, every state matters. Even in this last election, Biden won by enough of a margin, you know, more than 40 electoral votes, but it made significant impacts on states. When the tallying came up, people saw how close elections can really be. So every time there's an election, the media comes up with ideas as if they're unique and new. They're not. And say, so here's some other options that might work. And every other option has a consequence. And we have to keep that in mind. Just because an idea sounds better doesn't mean that it hasn't been thought of before or doesn't have significant issues. The first is the direct popular vote. This has been growing in popularity among our news media. But why have electors just go to a national popular vote? And some of the biggest problems with that is the fact that um, it would be very lengthy to make sure that every vote is correctly, correctly tabulated. At the end of the day, if there's 2,000 incorrect votes in Pennsylvania, the margin of victory is probably much bigger than that, that it doesn't swing an election. And then you would have the fact that presidents would usually just campaign in the cities where the base of the population lies and wouldn't be as worried about areas of less population. Another one is the national bonus plan. This is, hey, let's add 102 electors to the 538. And um, you win these as a winner take all as long as the candidate gets at least 40% of the national popular vote. District system, candidate who carries each congressional district would get that electoral vote and the candidate who carries the state would get the state's two additional electoral votes. So in this system, like Pennsylvania, has, has 18 districts or 20 electoral votes. 
that you would get a ele an electoral vote for every district you win, and then whoever wins the most districts would also get the additional two uh, electoral votes. And that probably sounds most possible, um, for, especially in a state like Pennsylvania that's so different from east to west, that people might like that idea because most counties vote Republican, but the population in, in Pennsylvania is clustered in the cities, and so Pennsylvania tends to go Democrat more so. And, and probably the one thing you're thinking of that could create a significant hindrance is that would actually strengthen the third party. Because third party candidates could come in and win a district here and a district there and start tabulating their own electoral vote count. Let's remember, while that's good to have more choices, it would most likely result in no one being able to reach 270. If no one reaches 270, then the House of Representatives has to vote in order to break um, the, the stalemate, and then they get to elect the president. And I don't think that that is a solution that the American people would really desire either. But they are all worth discussing. What about the advantages and disadvantages of the U.S. system of campaigns and elections? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. So let's remember what the primary function of elections is, right? There's three. We want to socialize and institutionalize political activity. It's an outlet for political engagement. Um, and it tends to limit protesting and riots because people see that they can directly get involved in the process and make a difference. Two, it provides regular access to the levers of political power. It permits leaders to be changed regularly to prevent coups or assassinations that a lot of other countries see. And as much as you might not like a president, or think that four or eight years is a really long period of time, we do have consistent turnover in presidential elections. Not as much in Congress, but we do see some turnover in Congress. On the state level, you see an ability to go out and cast your vote when you like or dislike something, and it makes a difference. And third, it serves to reinforce the legitimacy of the government in the eyes of the people. We, the people, are the ones that have created the government and have given up some of our own complete freedoms in order to be protected. We come into contract with government so that they can help us to protect life, liberty, and property. And if they aren't able to do that, we have the right to abolish that government. But instead of going to the extreme and having coups and abolishing systems, we can vote. And we can see major changes in policies in both the local, state, and increasingly federal level that people continue to be hopeful and engaged in trying to accomplish. Now, there's negatives, right? In the system of drawing out and carving out districts, we do know that things like gerrymandering occurs, right? When you draw an electoral district that favors one party over another. In the United States, the vast majority of congressional districts strongly favor either Republicans or Democrats. And seats in these electoral districts are term, you know, generally termed as safe seats, where traditionally the Democrat always wins or the Republican always wins. The incumbent office holder generally retains their seat in elections by very wide margins. Pennsylvania did go through a system of uh, being forced by the federal government to redistrict because of very many gerrymandered districts. Here's the example out here in eastern Pennsylvania, the old districts versus the new and how much more contiguous and concise they are. And it really pleased people to, to see that um, they were being grouped more geographically slash population rather than politically. But we do want to continue to fight against political parties redistricting in order to gain power. At this point, if you're in my class, of course, you're probably getting ready for a test. If you're not, I encourage you to take a look at the Electoral College system with some YouTube videos. Make sure you understand it and dive a little bit deeper into Federalist 68 to truly understand why our founding fathers created this really unique system. Okay, this is Social Studies with Mrs. Johns. This is the end of chapter nine.